live. Okay. I don't think it should do that. Okay. It normally would do it with music, not with, um... No, I think it should be okay, because I've seen a lot of stuff like this on other nature journaling stuff. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Um... Yeah, could we rewind a little bit? I'm so sorry to waste your time like that. I thought we were live because everyone was in the chat. Where did we leave off? Where did we stop? I think we need to go back to what is a cephalopod. Just <laughs> Seriously? The whole thing? Okay. Or just go back to wherever you want. I'm so sorry about that. Sure. How many people do you still have? Um... Stop talking at um, sea slugs. We got further than what is a cephalopod. Have they seen any of the video, your folks? I don't think so. They've just been going crazy in chat and I thought that they were paying attention to that. So wherever you want to start from. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, let's just start with squid skin. So, okay, what we're looking at here is uh, squid skin under the microscope really close up. So we've got a bunch of expanding and contracting uh, structures called chromatophores, each of which are directly controlled by the brain. So um, each one is a little sphere of pigment. Each cephalopod species has different um, colors in its palette to choose from. And each of the little spheres is surrounded by muscles. So when the muscles contract, it pulls the little sphere into like a pancake shape so that you can actually see the color. Underneath the chromatophores, you have iridophores. Iridophores are slower moving. They're controlled by hormones instead of uh, the brain. I mean, in a sense, hormones are also controlled by the brain, but um, the direct action on the structure is a hormone flowing through the system as opposed to a direct link via neurons. And so um, you can see that they're slowly changing between a blue color and like a yellow green color. Um, and so when you put all this together, you get the uh, full color changing ability of the animal. In addition to color change, they also have the ability to change texture. Um, so these are like extreme goosebumps. They're called papillae and they are change the, the, the texture of the animal that helps break up their body pattern and makes helps them to blend into whatever they're uh, whatever they're trying to camouflage with. Um, this can be this color changeability can be used for all kinds of things in cephalopods, and they often use it to communicate. So what we're looking at here are two reef squid. Reef squid live from the east coast of Florida down to northern South America, and we're looking at a female right here and a male right here. And it's really important for the male to constantly be signaling like positive vibes to the female and aggressive uh, vibes to everybody else because he wants to make sure that no one else comes and messes with his female, his mate. Um, and so you'll see when he is right behind her, he switches really quick from having the friendly pattern on his left side to his right side. So he's always showing her a friendly pattern. Sometimes uh, these animals use their color changing ability to signal that they're very tough and dangerous. So in this case, um, you're seeing a flamboyant cuttlefish. They live uh, all over the Indo-Pacific um, uh, and mostly just walking around on the seafloor um, to signal to other animals that like, you shouldn't eat me because I'm very poisonous. Um, they, they aren't actually poisonous, but they are giving the vibes that they are. So generally they don't get eaten. Is everything looking okay on the tech it side? It looks great, yeah. I just wanted to okay. make sure that everyone could see stuff. And good, good. I'm still very okay. new to this, so thank you great. for being so patient. For sure. Uh, so this is a broad club cuttlefish. They also live throughout the Indo-Pacific. They're about the size of a football or a rugby ball. Um, they are using what's called passing clouds. So having the ability to control each one of your little chromatophores directly with the brain is super useful um, because you can put, put together really complex uh, patterns. And so um, this cuttlefish is trying to confuse a crab by doing this like wild uh, hypnotic thing. The crab uh, gets visually overwhelmed and that allows the cuttlefish to attack. Um, they can also use this color change to threaten each other. So this is two big male Australian or giant Australian cuttlefish. Um, during mating season, the, um, the fighting basically between males is pretty intense. And so you can see in this one's back, 
that it's doing like a zebra stripe moving pattern to show how big and tough he is. Um, in addition to changing color, squid can also glow. Um, in the ocean, generally speaking, uh, bioluminescence is incredibly common. When you go down past a certain depth in the ocean, there's really not a lot of light around. So it's really beneficial to make your own. Starfish, uh, dinoflagellates, um, fish, shrimp, jellyfish, all sorts of animals uh, will create their own light down past a certain depth. Around 80% of animals will create light um, at what's called the twilight zone. Um, and of course, squid are no exception to that. So a vampire squid um, is what I'm going to show you first. They normally, with the lights on, look like this. But sometimes they want to look even bigger and scarier than that. And so what they do, they've got little photophores, which are the structures that create the light, on each of the tips of their arms. And so this one just like inverted itself like an umbrella. Um, and even though the eyes of the animal are here, these two spots that you're seeing are way bigger than their actual eyes and are way up here because they want to look huge. And so by holding your arms out as wide as you can and shining lights from it makes the animal look bigger and more threatening than they may actually be. Um, and so that's what the vampire squid is using that for. Uh, firefly squid use a, a, a just like array of blue and green photophores that are really beautiful on their backs to blend in with light coming down from above and we think maybe um, in some circumstances to attract a mate. In addition to their uh, collection of photophores on their back, they also have two really, really, really bright photophores at the tips of their tentacles. So arms um, have suction cups going all along their body. Squid have eight arms and then they have two tentacles. The tentacles most of the time are tucked between all of the arms um, and the clubs at the ends of the tentacles have really bright photophores. Or not for this animal, have really bright photophores. Generally speaking, they don't in most squid, but a couple of squid do. Um, and most of the time they're hidden between the arms and they just shoot out when they want to grab something to eat. Um, and so in Japan, in uh, I think Toyama Bay is where these squid live. Um, they will fish for them in June. Um, and these squid will be super, super abundant because they all come to that bay to mate. And so uh, they'll, there'll be like a whole big squid fishing festival for these squid. And like when they pull up the nets, the nets are just blue because there's so much light coming off these squid. It's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Okay. So we could play spot the cephalopod, but I think I'd rather um, we just... Uh, answer questions at this point, if that's okay with that's you. That's totally okay with me. Um, Great. Yeah. So let me see if anyone has any questions. Put them in the chat now. Let's see. Give me a moment to type. Take, yeah, take your time. Yeah. So I've got one. So with the arms versus tentacles on squid, um, mm -hmm. what's the function of those? Uh, so arms are you are like muscular. They have suction cups all along the edge. Um, they're used for manipulating a lot of things, for touching things, for moving things around. Um, and the tentacles are just used for feeding. So uh, I'll go back to that slide that had the uh, the anatomical descriptions on them. So oh, here's yeah, great. arms here, and then the tentacles here. Tentacles mostly are hidden, um, and this part of the tentacle is really, really, really stretchy. So it can like shoot out really far, grab stuff, and then bring it back to their mouth. Um, additionally, generally speaking, the tips of the tentacles, and we call clubs, they're kind of like their hands, um, the suction cups at that part of their body will have um, like a ring of teeth inside of it and that really helps dig into whatever they're eating in some species they also have teeth uh like circles of teeth in the arm suction cups it just depends on the species would those be found on any of the large squid that like the Rhesus dolphins attack oh yeah i mean any big squid so humboldt squid giant squid colossal squid they all have um the rings of teeth for sure yeah even little squid, like market squid, have that. Okay. That's crazy. So yeah. we have a question. Um, are there any endangered squid or octopi? Not, not that I know of. So I don't think any cephalopods, with the exception of the nautilus, are 
threatened or endangered right now. Um, generally speaking, over the last decade, cephalopods were doing pretty well. There was a, a paper put out in 2016 that was basically like, it's the decade of the cephalopods because everybody's doing so great. Partially because we had fished out a lot of their predators. Um, when you fish out all of the big fish that eat squid, uh, squid do better. Um, but with climate change really hitting us hard, um, the areas that they can be happy and healthily live in are getting smaller. So any given cephalopod species can have like a range of temperatures that they're going to feel happy and comfortable in. Um, and uh, oh, I wasn't even sharing my screen during that time. Oh, well. Um, and as it gets hotter, the geographical area gets smaller. So, so there probably will be soon, just not yet. Yeah, it sounds like everything. And then with some creatures like the, what are they called? The flamboyant cuttlefish, are they going to be struggling once reefs start to disappear or are they like in more of a kelp forest habitat? So they definitely are more of a reefy uh, kind of animal compared to a kelpy uh, animal. And uh, yeah, certainly possible. It, it's kind of hard to predict. I mean, cephalopods have survived five mass extinctions now. So um, some cephalopods might make it through the six. They probably will, all yeah. things considered. There are just like, That's there's nowhere in the ocean that cephalopods aren't. Like the, there's there's a cephalopod in, in any part of the ocean um, that I'm aware of. So um, you never know uh, what they're gonna do. There are like 700 species of cephalopod that pales in comparison to like even moths. Like there are so many more moths than there are cephalopods. Oh yeah, I saw you did uh, some moth research up in the Pine Barrens. Um, Oh yeah, I was um, I was helping yesterday with ant research, and then I just go into the pine barrens with moths for fun. Um, I just like to see who shows up and hang out with my friends out there. Nice. Um, so that's not going to like legit science. That's just me having a good time. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so there. I I don't know. We'll we'll see how cephalopods do um, with climate change. There are also a lot of cephalopods that live so deep that like we wouldn't even know if they were endangered um, because we see them so infrequently that if they had had their populations tank over the last 50 years, we would have no idea. So hard to say. We could only recently have gotten the um, like submersible with the camera technology really good um, to be down there all the time that, you know, hard to say. Yeah, so you got some questions. So um, first one is how much, or what was it? So how precise individual control do they have over each chromatophore? Total, complete control over each individual chromatophore, but um, I don't really know how they mentally manage all of that. Um, yeah. They seem to do it, but I don't know how. That seems hard to me, but they do it. And then there's the follow-up to that one, which is they can make overall patterns like the flowing flashing patterns, um, but they, oh, but could they match a specific background pattern, for instance? Yes and no. So they're generally speaking, when a, a cuttlefish, for example, is going to blend in, trying to camouflage, um, there are kind of three main patterns that they choose. There's uniform, which as it sounds, just look like one big color, uh, modeled, which is like speckly looking, and then disruptive. Disruptive is like big patches of white and dark. Um, the purpose of disruptive is much like a zebra, like breaking up where your body begins and ends. Because a lot of times when predators are out there looking for dinner, they're looking for like the outline of food. And so if you break up your body pattern, it becomes really hard to like just spot you in the first place. And so that's what disruptive is all about. A bunch of different animals use this body pattern to hide. Um, and so they, they're never really like looking at a background and precisely matching it. There's one picture I have of one doing a pretty good job of that. But, um, but typically they're kind of using some go-to um, patterns. Like this one I think is doing a pretty good job. The cuttlefish is right here and it is matching, I think pretty darn well with the background, but they don't always match the background precisely. Like this octopus, there's nothing in the background that looks like this, but it does generally fit the vibe. And so that makes them hard to find. Um, and then let's see. So this is an animal doing uniform right here. It looked at this whole area and was like, you know, I think I'd be best pretending to be something like this visual element. Um, and then this is an animal here um, doing what it thinks kind of would fit into this area. Um, it's sticking its arms up to look more like the um, pointy 
um, algae uh, slash coral in the environment and then making its uh, back look really pointy to also look as much like the algae around it. Yeah, he's very convincing. So someone wants to know if there's a specific word for when a predator is camouflaging themselves instead of trying to hide to avoid being eaten. They're, you know, Ooh, they're that's a good eaten. question. There might be, but I don't know what it is. Um, like ambush? Well, no, it's not an ambush. There's a bunch of species that do. There must be a name. But I'm sure the ecologists have a name for it. I don't know yeah. what it is, but yeah. So you studied squid immunology, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So I'm not curious. Do you have, what's special about their immune systems? I know as oceans warm, we're seeing a lot more viruses in uh, warmer areas of the ocean. So are they susceptible to that? Are they do they have remarkable immune systems or? I don't have um. What's what's different about their immune system is that it's a lot simpler than ours. So okay. um, humans have a lot of different types of white blood cells, um, B cells, T cells, killer cells, like all, all sorts of different things that do different things. Um, cephalopods pretty much have one type of white blood cell as far as we're aware. It's a lot like a macrophage for anybody who's had cell biology. Um, they're kind of like a multi-purpose, relatively big um, destroyer and cleaner up of things. Um, they don't have adaptive immunity like we do. Um, hopefully everybody in the audience has been vaccinated in some way, shape or form that's introducing yeah. <laughs> the, a pathogen to your body that your body then uh, creates B cells too, um, that make antibodies against the thing that you've been introduced to. Um, they don't have any of that, um, but they're still able to like learn some things over the course of their lives. And we don't understand how that works. So um, when they're introduced to something um, a second time, or particularly when they learn that one of the organisms, the bacteria specifically living with them is like, supposed to be there. Um, backing up a second, like bacteria are good and bad and neutral depending on the situation and the diff individual bacterium. So yeah. we have bacteria living all over our skin, all throughout our digestive system in various other parts of our body that are really, really essential for keeping us healthy. And it's the same in squid. It's the same in most animals. Um, there are a couple weirdos that don't have a lot of beneficial bacteria, but most of us do. Right. Um, and so it's really important for our immune system and a squid's immune system to know what bacteria they should leave alone because it's helping the animal. And so over the life of a squid, the squid's immune system learns like, oh, this bacteria is helpful. I'm going to leave it alone. How do they learn that? We don't know. Um, how like what's the mechanism there? We really don't understand because they don't have the same mechanisms of like immune learning that we do. Right. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, yeah it's really wild. Let's see if I have more questions in there. Okay. Um, you know, it'd be kind of fun to do is could we talk a little about uh, squid anatomy and how they're put together? So when we try and draw them, we kind of like understand the building blocks of squid. Sure. Uh, yeah. Wait. How are there so many different? Um, I thought I was showing this before, but then I realized I wasn't actually sharing the screen at the time. Um, where did it go? I'm gonna stop this button and restart. There it is. Okay. So here we have all the different cephalopods and their anatomies. So, um, here's the basic makeup of any cephalopod. There are mantles. So the mantle is the part of the body where all of the organs are held. And then we've got their head, which is what has their eyes and their brain right in the middle here. And then out of their face comes their arms. Um, for cuttlefish and squid, they've got eight arms, two tentacles. Um, when it comes to octopuses, they've got eight arms, no tentacles. So let's go through the mantle of everybody. The toothoid squids, so those are the squids that you might eat in calamari, kind of torpedo shaped. The mantle is back here and then the face and then the arms. In a bobtail squid, the mantle is in the same place. The fins are in the same place, but their body is a little rounder. Um, that's also true for cuttlefish over here. Their bodies are generally a little rounder. Um, but still attached to the face, attached to the arms. Um, a nautilus, on the other hand, um, basically built the same, um, but they look really different. So the mantle is here and then buried in the shell here, the eyes right there. The eyes are totally different from other cephalopods. Their eyes are much more simple. They're like a, a pinhole camera type eye compared to the lens camera 
in the other cephalopods. Um, and then instead of having those eight arms um, and or two tentacles, they just have like a ton of cirri and uh, little tentacles coming out their face here, like up to 100, 60, 100, depending on the animal. Um, super weird. They also have this like hood thing, um, which is just different from all of the others. Um, the Nautilus broke off in evolutionary time from everybody else a really long time ago. So they end up looking a little different. Um, in a octopus, the mantle looks like their head, but it's not really their head, it's their mantle. Um, and that's like the round part behind their eyes. That's where all of their organs are. Um, and then their eyes, their brain is right about here. And then they have those eight arms coming coming out kind of in a web around their bodies. All of these animals across the board have a beak that's in the center of their arms or Siri in the case of the Nautilus. Um, and most of those beaks have venom associated with them, but not necessarily venom that affects people. There's only like one that is particularly dangerous to people and that's the blue ring octopus. Um, the rest of them, a lot of times, like if you're a squid, if you're a cuttlefish, um, you want to eat crabs, shrimp, sometimes fish. Um, and so you want your venom to be effective against the things that you're eating. They're not eating humans because we're not hanging out where they're hanging out. So um, having venom that affects us wouldn't be super useful. Um, it's just sort of a coincidence that the blue ring octopus has venom that affects us too. So that's uh, your really quick anatomy lesson for the yeah. cephalopods. That's really cool. So we had another question that was, um, where was it? Okay, so how do cephalopods interact with and impact the health of kelp forests and coral reefs? Okay, um, they don't interact as much, as aside, aside from like being part of the ecosystem, um, generally speaking, uh, the squid are more out in open water. They're not hanging out as much in um, kelp forests. And they're not like directly impacting the coral like um, urchins or sea otters or anything like that. Um, they're certainly part of the greater ecosystem. And what, what they're mostly serving as in the ecosystem, squid anyway, um, are a food source. So yeah. uh, squid reproduce really fast compared to other animals. They can produce thousands and thousands of babies. And so they're mostly the food for the sharks, the sea lions, the bigger fish in the ecosystem. So that's like their main um, ecosystem service. Um, octopuses, similar deal, um, serving as food, but not in as great abundance as the squid. Right. Um, when it comes to reefs, um, they're also just like kind of like a member of the community. So there are a lot of different squid. The squid that most hang out in reefs would be cuttlefish. Um, and the pygmy squid and bobtail squid. Um, but they're not directly impacting like the coral as much as other animals might. Right. But they're definitely a member of the community and essential for that purpose. So in open water, when vertical migration, do they do open water squid do most of their feeding? in like twilight zone or do they feed mostly up near the surface? They're, so the thing about squid, they're eating all the time because oh. they are incredibly highly energetic. They're, they're really working hard constantly. And yeah. so they're eating most of the time. Um, they will follow the food up toward the surface um, at night and then they go back down during the day. But there's rarely a, a time when a squid's been um, given an opportunity to eat, they're not gonna take it. Um, so they're, yeah, they're eating whenever they can. I think reef squid eat more at night than they do during the day. Um, but they're not really vertically migrating all that much because they're hanging out on the reef. So those guys are definitely bringing up a bunch of nutrients from the depths and dispersing that throughout the food system. That's really yep, yep. cool. Do you know who whales eat squid or yeah. is that more of a fish thing? Oh, Whales eat a lot of squid. Some whales can eat like 700 squid a day. <laughs> so they're for sure eating a lot of squid, yeah. Yeah, let's see if there's any more questions in the chat. Um, okay, so Nautilus question. Is the shell symmetrical or does it have a, a chirality handedness like snail shells? Ooh, I don't know. That's a great question. They look symmetrical to me, but I don't know really what chirality is. Like I've heard the word a million times, but I don't really know what that means. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I, really I think like to look at just, the they just kind of go up and down. Um, do I have an Nautilus shell? No. Um, 
I think it's symmetrical, but man, I don't know. Yeah, cool question. That's our resident uh, math nerd. Um, I'm sure she'll come up with an answer for us later. Okay. um, Let's see, you've got some cephalopod humor. And yeah, let's see. Yeah, okay, well, I think if anyone has any more questions, put them in the chat. If not, I think maybe fun to go on to doing some cephalopod art. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome to stick around for that, or if you want, um, it's been great having you. Yeah, of course. If anybody um, wants, like, realizes later that they have a question, you can always um, get at me on Twitter, Instagram, or uh, TikTok, uh, but I don't answer questions as much on TikTok as I do on Twitter and Instagram. So okay. I am at uh, Sarah McAttack across the board on social media. Um, feel free to reach out whenever you want. Um, I'm always available to answer squid questions. There's also the Squid Facts hotline. Um, you can text that for a squid fact. That's one eight three three sci text. Um, and if you type that in your iPhone, it knows where to send it. Um, Back in the day, we used to uh, have numbers, associated, like letters associated with numbers on the phone. Um, I've realized that uh, younger people don't know that. Uh, but when you look at your phone and there's those like uh, letters on there, that's what that's about. Um, that's all I have. I also have a coloring book. Um, if oh, you, yes. Like, that's really cool. Do you have a copy that we could see? Yeah, I do. That's where the first uh, yeah, page. So it's called The Incredible. I'm not like gotcha. an artist. I was making this you for know, my godson. And then I decided to. Yeah. Well, with the Nature Journal Club, it's less about creating, like, amazing art, and it's more about, like, creating things that kind of enhance your experience with interpreting nature and science. Great. Yeah, so each uh, each page comes with, like, a little bit of information about a cephalopod or, like, a cephalopod concept. So we've got, like, flying squid and... Uh, Say flying squid? Oh, flying squid, yeah. So they... I didn't um, know that was a thing. ...take their arm, their arms, and, like, web them... Um, so that they can glide off the air and then they put their fins out too and then they like Whoa. shoot their jet propulsion out of the water and then glide along the surface much like a flying fish but it's a squid yeah uh, and i have this page it's all like how big cephalopods are in relation to a person or each other um it's 15 bucks on amazon if you want to buy it you should okay. yeah um, definitely that will be my go-to gift for any children in my life great that is so cool, and you definitely are an artist. Oh, thanks. That's so cool. I have some friends who are like professional artists, like that's their whole job, and like compared to them, I'm not an artist, but but I appreciate the validation, much appreciated. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, and, oh, I just uh, really wanted to briefly talk about, you have that awesome organization, Skype a Scientist, which is so yeah. cool, I mean, that's what we're doing it through right now. Are you guys right, still yeah. doing your fundraising? Yes, we're always fundraising because we're like a very scrappy, small nonprofit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we um, are an international organization that matches uh, scientists with classrooms, clubs, scout troops, libraries. Anybody who needs to talk to a scientist will match you with one for free. Um, if you know any teachers or anybody like librarians, whatever, who need to talk to a scientist, please tell them our program exists. We have so many volunteers that are ready to go uh, at your convenience. Um, and if you want to donate, um, we're, we would sure appreciate it. And I'll put that link in there too. Um, we also have a live stream series that goes during the school year. It's once a week ish. Um, this fall, we're talking with a roboticist with somebody who does experimental, uh, agriculture. So like working with like new strains of like watermelon, like a personal watermelon or like a purple watermelon instead of a blue green red one or like whatever. Um, and he's a delight. Uh, so we're talking to him. We're talking to people who work on space and bats and all sorts of stuff. Um, that's also on the website. You can RSVP for all of those events. They're free. They're that's fun. So and then they're cool. posted. What a great after. resource. Thanks. Yeah, we'll definitely share that. We've got um, another part of Nature Journal Club, which is the Nature Journal Educators Forum. And great. I'm sure there's going to be people who would love to hear about that. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. All right. Well, you have a great rest of your day. Um, if you post your uh, squid art on social media, please tag me because I love it. Oh, seeing. I will. Yeah. There will definitely be some after this. I've been practicing, so we're probably going to go through and talk about like how to draw some of the stuff you showed us. Uh, what was the thing called where the cephalopod was doing that flashing to like hypnotize the crab? 
was that passing the- cloud passing okay. cloud passing cloud all right i will definitely put that in the nature journal part of this great yeah. sounds good all right well uh i'll catch you later all right thank you so much for doing this um yeah everyone go follow her and yeah now we'll do the art segment of it so great all right bye right. bye thank you Okay, so now let's get some art stuff going. I just need to rearrange my screen. Um, all right, here we go. Let's do some squid art. It's not going to be as good as Jamir Laws, but you know, I guess I try. So here we go. So I'm thinking we start off with squid because, you know. We talked the most about their anatomy. I got some notes here, but let's see what we can do with this. Should we get a reference picture up? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, give me one moment. I'll get that up there. Trig's gonna be finding a way to have a reference picture and. Um, The drawing. I apologize, give me one moment to get. Oh wait, actually. Nope. That one. Oh shoot. Sorry, one moment, technical difficulties. Here we go. Squid pictures. Let's see. Can you guys see that okay? I think if I get the squid over here and then that over there. How's that for a visual? Perfect. Thanks for bearing with me on that. Oh, wait, oops. Now you guys can see that. Market squid. Alright, come on. Like that. Okay, so we'll start with some squid anatomy. Then we we'll start to just make a nice circle like everyone does with their art. I'm going to make another circle to show that head area and mark where the eyes are going to go. Make a bigger lump for tentacles. shape, some parallel lines going so I can get a better view of where the eyes should be. What it looks like.
So lately I've been using this red Prismacolor, which is basically like the ones that John Muir Laws uses, uh, except his are a really pale blue, and I feel like they don't leave enough of a mark for me, so I've just been using the red because it creates a light mark and I can draw over it and it kind of disappears, but it stays enough where I can see my sketch lines. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some banding on there to try and help see it as a 3D object. Let's see. Is there any particular thing with the squid that you guys would like to do a drawing demo of? Or should we just go through some reference pictures and kind of do a draw along type thing? I guess we're just doing a draw along now. case. I'm going to do a draw along. I'll try and part any uh, technical stuff that I can come up with on, but I don't know how to draw a squid, so you're going to learn with me. <laughs> Anyways, so I put my first layer down, just colored pencil so it's easy to see, and then I'm going to come in with, that must be a 2B. I think the key for drawing anything that moves around a bunch is to try and like block in the shape that stays the same and then like, maybe we should try from a video. I feel like that would be very challenging. Um, but when things move, what I tend to do is I'll draw the part that stays still or the part that I get the best view of and then from there I will um, try and add a little detail or at least illustrate the motion that goes on. There, we got watercolors out and start in with some shadow violet. With that I'm just going to go and glaze in all the areas that need to be darkened. Another thing great to put in the chat is I just got a professional zoom count so I could do longer ones. Um, what I could do from now on is switch to doing these classes on zoom so that everyone can join in um, and then I can edit them later and put them on YouTube or I can keep them as being YouTube live streams. They don't have a preference. So I get that first layer in, and then I'm going to make some more concentrated version of Shadow Violet on my palette. And I'm going to start to touch up in some of those areas. I'm going to blend out a little.
lesson for future classes. I have one that I could possibly do where I've got a naturalist um, who specializes in birding on whale watching boats who I think would like to come in. And then from the sea otter idea, okay, doing it on Zoom would be nice. We could actually chat during it. Might yeah, that was my worry about doing it with Zoom and initially because I didn't want to have like a Zoom bombing or anything uh, like that one class that John Laws had, especially if I was trying to make it like a nice public event and at least like this I knew I could moderate like what became public. That being said, I don't think that there's enough of a crowd on here yet that I'd really worry about anyone saying anything terrible. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to do moderator uh, or help with that, I would love that. So maybe next time we can set up as a Zoom meeting instead and then everyone come in and chat because that'd be fun. And especially if we get have people come in and share because that's one thing I really love about doing stuff with John Your Laws is the chance to share and I feel like this is kind of, or that's kind of what this is missing and we've got such a great community. Anyways, I put my shading in on the squid, as you can see, and then once that dries, I'm going to go and start putting some color on that. I might do it before it starts to dry because I have no patience, and we're just going to see how it goes. So I'm just going to mix up a nice little mess on my palette of some like yellowish tint and start to put it in the areas that that yellow and just let it be kind of wet and loose and mix in everywhere. Blow up the tentacles. some of that potter's pink on the body since you get that nice little granulation. Just mix that in everywhere. Get a little bit of green. I've got this really cool green that does some brown stuff. I forget what it's called. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Evea has Zoom Bomber Shutdown Experience. You're like the bomb squad. That's kind of cool. Yeah, okay, well next time I will do that. We'll make it a live event so everyone can join in. I think that'll probably be more fun anyways and probably make for better viewing than me awkwardly trying to do a voiceover while I paint. Um, so I think what would be cool for this one is I'm going to do some anatomical labeling on here. So wait for that to dry. I think what would be really neat is to do a little diagram about how the what was it? The chromatophores work on a squid. So do them like that. Nice little bubble. So the whole thing was you have rounded chromatophores that are compact between two layers of muscle and then when that's compressed that squishes the pigment flat and creates those spots.
think there'd be a lot of potential to do some really fun stuff with letting watercolors just sort of run out in um, this kind of art because they just move out in, well the colors on these things move in such crazy ways dries, I think I'm going to do another squid to demonstrate what that's used for. I forget what that was exactly on the reef squid that did it. The passing cloud, or how he was doing it. So lock him in. Some bilateral lines. Yeah, I think I definitely need a co-host, besides Colette, though I think she'd do a good job at adding her own voiceover. cool thing here is if you use those stripes right then you can create the curvature on the squid or at least suggest it question. Before you learned science illustration, where were you taking classes? How was the program? So I was at Western Washington University doing a four-year course in environmental policy, or rather undergraduate. So first part of it, I studied um, just sort of general liberal studies, a uh, lot of science. I did some robotics, uh, just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And then I did some political science. I wanted to talk about environmental issues and no one else did, so I headed on over to the environmental studies department and signed up there. And then all we did was talk about environmental problems, which um, is a lot, so. <laughs> 
Yeah. And then one of the things I found once I started working in the field was that a big part of the job that I felt like was kind of getting neglected a little bit was figuring out how to make science readily understandable to people who aren't trained to interpret it. And I found that visuals were really helpful. And what actually got me started thinking about doing scientific illustration in the career again was I was working for this nonprofit and we did a lot of facilitating environmental consulting for houses on um, eroding bluffs on the coastline. And a lot of times, the people who I'd be with would be trying to explain to the homeowners what was going on with like tidal currents and soil being deposited and all these other natural factors, and they'd be struggling to understand. And then I would pull out my notebook and draw a picture of like, it'd be very crude and whatnot, but it made so much sense to have a visual of what was going on and it really helped people. And so I thought, you know, I can take the science, I can take the policy part of that and find something that doesn't have me sitting in an office begging for grant money. Um, there's no shame in that. I mean, of course there's not. People need to do that. It's good work. I just didn't see that as something that I could spend all my time doing without going crazy. I like to work with my hands, I like being intellectually stimulated, and this is like the perfect midpoint between. Also, I'm sure Colette would love to be uh, the co-host. I'll bring her next time. She could co-host next time. Or be one of them. some chromatophores onto this guy. Let's Oh, um, so Via asks, had you said that you started to take classes in a scientific illustration program then found they weren't teaching enough? So I briefly was working through um, the Rhode Island School of Design's certificate program for scientific illustration. And while I'm sure it's good, um, a lot of the classes that were specifically geared towards scientific illustration weren't really available. and I found myself just learning a lot more from working through the the course material that was available for free through John Muir Laws, and I felt like I was getting more from that, so I decided that I would work on working through that course material and then seek out a program that would have more intensive like scientific illustration in person once that became available again. So hopefully the CSU and B program is in my future. Um, yeah. Okay, the other thing I want to draw is, where are they? Oh, here's my pencil. So that squid that did the half and half thing, that was really cool. Two squid. Don't remember their exact body type, but there's the female.
through some little speech bubbles since they talk with their skin. Alright, well, there's my Squid Journal page. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I would love to see anything that you guys create or come up with this. Tag me in your Instagram posts from this event, and um, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>